Hi, welcome to another Spectrum Economics video. Today we're going to still be on the topic of Economics is Everywhere and this is still part of the Economics is Everywhere series. So, so far I had an introduction video where I talked about a general work day, so the kind of decisions you make in a work day in terms of what you do when you get up in the morning, how you get to work, some decisions you might make at work in regards to like whether you're going to eat out or whether you're going to have your lunch with you, you're going to eat in the office, at your desk or in the little canteen area, or whether you're going to go straight home after work or whether you're going to go out and do some stuff with, you know, with your colleagues or your friends and stuff like that. And what kind of concepts may influence you on that? But today we're going to be a lot more focused and we're going to look at economics is everywhere in regards to a visit to the supermarket. So where do we start off? You're at home and you realise you don't have enough groceries. So, you don't have enough bread, you can't make sandwiches, you don't have some cereal for your breakfast, you, you don't have any vegetables, you don't have, you know, potato and any of that stuff, the usual stuff, your sauces and all that, and maybe some of your toiletries and things. So, and that could come around, you know, maybe once a week or maybe every couple of days, depending on how you organise yourself. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to the supermarket? So, do you have a car to start with? If you don't have a car, then maybe you'll have to walk to the supermarket or take a bus. So, that makes it a little bit inconvenient, I might say, if you do not have a car. So if you're just walking down the road, you, you know, you could be very fortunate. And while I used to live in England, you, you actually got a lot of shops and, on the high street and all near where you live. So they have like little supermarkets, grocery stores, it's literally like five or ten minutes walk away, you just pop out and bring something in. And you can make those short trips. And that was easy enough in the sense that if you, you, you could just go out and, and get something convenient like every day, almost every other day. So for one on to two days worth of food, so maybe about four or five meals. And if there's not many people in the family, then it's not too bad. Uh, if you have a car, it makes it easier in the sense you've got a car, you've got a boot in the car, you can transport a lot more stuff back. But also a car makes it more convenient as well. So you could go a little bit further afield, so then you can get stuff and you can come back and maybe it may be a 10 minute journey by car. If you were to take the bus, for example, it could be a half an hour, 40 minute journey. So what I'm going to talk about now in terms of our decision in regards to frequency. How often do we go to the supermarket? So if your supermarket is just down the road and you can walk there and you can come back, you don't need a car, you can probably make fairly frequent trips, it won't be inconvenient. If the supermarket is quite far away and you don't have a car, then you would probably be more tempted to make less frequent trips. Whereas the car helps you and enables you to make more frequent trips because of that added convenience. So again, that factors in that, that loss of convenience by having to travel a long way, it's going to make you less uh, likely to make more trips. And uh, there's still a number of things that have sort of proven that people with cars tend to have more trips to supermarkets simply because it is quite easy. But if, like I said, if you're living in England, you're off a high street, then you don't necessarily need a car. And also your carrying capacity without the car is a little bit limited, so you may not be able to make, uh, should I say, you may have to make more trips because you can't bring back a week's worth of shopping by carrying. So it's, it's an interesting way of going about it in terms of an interesting psychology behind it as well. But what else involved affects our shopping? So some people are okay with having canned food, processed food and stuff like that. And if you've got processed food, then that's generally got a long life. So you could buy a few cans and how long does a can of baked beans last? So there's several years, I think. I've got stuff in the cupboard out there, baked beans, Heinz baked beans or something, and it lasts until 2020. Obviously, I'm not going to go shopping every three years, but if, if you get what I mean, you can actually put shopping off a little bit by having lot of this long life sort of food. But that's not everybody's cup of tea, right? And to be honest with you, I like to have some fresh food as well. So, and fresh dust, fresh produce doesn't last particularly long. So you may be forced to actually go down to your market, your grocers, whatever, on a more regular basis to actually have more fresh foods. Or you could work it in such a way that maybe you eat a lot of fresh towards the beginning of the week and maybe you have more of a can and the processed stuff later on in the week. So there's certain ways of working around it in terms of what is optimal for your timing of going to the supermarket and stuff like that. So generally, I would say if you really, really just like to eat fresh produce, then you're probably going to have to make more trips because, like I say, a lot of this stuff doesn't last very long. How about the size of the family? That makes it interesting as well. If you've got a very large family, then even for a couple of days, you're probably going to need quite a lot of shopping. You know, there's like 10, 15 people in your family, in your household. You're going to need a lot of food for those people. So you're going to need a mode of transport, something like a car or whatever you can actually put the groceries in. So it could become inconvenient if you're doing an awful lot of shopping 
on a regular basis. You might want to get just one massive big shop at one of your very large supermarkets. And also as well, decision making is also interesting too, in the sense that if you've got 12 people in your family, for example, it's unlikely you're going to bring all 12 people to the supermarket. You could, you could, but I'm just saying you probably wouldn't. So then the one or two people that are going to get the groceries are going to make decisions on behalf of the other people. So there's got to be decisions and conversations that need to take place before that supermarket trip. And then there's going to be occasions when not everything that you want is available. So those people are going to have to make a judgment call. And it helps if people know each other within the family and what their preferences are very well. So ideally you want someone who can drive to go. And you also want someone who is actually familiar with what everybody else likes. Or maybe you just want the person who does the cooking, who basically does the preparation of food anyway. We can't really argue too much with them in regards to what they're going to cook and things like that. So it makes the the thought process is a little bit different. You've got a very small family, one or two people. You could actually have the two people in the household just going down together. You don't need to make those decisions. It makes it a lot simpler and also less likely to have conflict. Like I said, it's just one person, just myself, for example, just getting the groceries of a small family. So not a lot of people I need to please. Another thing that makes a difference is the type of supermarket. Do you have like a little green grocers or a little, you know, quickie mart or something like that? Convenience store, then you're not going to get an awful lot of shopping simply because you can't because they don't have the quantity. But if you've got something like a Costco, for example, you can see the picture here, they sell in bulk and that is going to be ideal for your very large families and you'd expect the very large families to go there. But whereas you've just got one or two people, I can't really buy in bulk because, well, it's a bit expensive for one person. Secondly, I may have to have the same meal every single day for five months or something like that. It just doesn't necessarily appeal to me. So the size of the supermarket that you go to makes a difference. But normally, in this world, we, we have a choice of what supermarkets we can go to. And I generally don't go to Costco. I would go to some of the smaller ones that I have around here in the neighborhood that suit my needs a little bit better. But I'm saying that if you've got a large family, a very large supermarket, whatever, would actually save money and could be preferable. Again, though, it's probably still looking at buying large quantity stuff more on the processed sort of food and things like that. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the uh, economics that we've uh, applied so far. So, first one I have a look at is, again, we talk about is uh, utility. It's a very, very common one. And again, we're trying to maximize our utility out of things that we buy and how we go about buying them. So, if you really love fresh produce, then you would maximize your utility by buying that, but making maybe more frequent trips to the supermarket, even if it's a little bit more convenient, but that added extra flavor and enjoyment out of the fresh food, you consider it worthwhile. Another thing you have to bear in mind, I've talked about utility in the previous one, so it's, uh, in terms of what utility is, sorry if I didn't say that before, it's your level of satisfaction that you get out of things. Um, another concept I want to talk about more this time though is what we call bounded rationality. And this is a situation where you don't know everything. And that is most of the time when you go shopping. You go to a supermarket, even if they're small supermarkets out there, are so many brands. And you don't know exactly how good every single brand is. So you may base your information on past experience. Okay. That's what we call satisficing. It reaches your basic requirement and you're happy with that. There could be another brand that's far superior, but you don't know and it involves taking a risk. And that may not reach your bare minimum requirement. You may go off of friends' recommendations or television adverts and anything like that, and you feel that those things will meet your basic requirement. There's a little bit more of a risk of something you haven't tried before, but generally we can't completely maximize our level of satisfaction from the supermarket because there are so many brands that we couldn't possibly know which brands are absolutely perfect for us. And also there's a number of brands that come and go as well. I've had like certain things I really like and suddenly it's gone. It's like, oh, I've got to change brands. And it's a bit of a trial and error on that side of thing. I just try and get basically what suits my needs and something I'm fairly confident with. So maybe I had a number two brand, for example, I might switch to that and possibly experiment with another brand. But it's, it's impossible in some ways that we talked about maximizing our satisfaction. But it's just to get that level that, that suits us. Okay, another concept I want to talk about, not so much applied by your individual shoppers, but applied by the companies and the products and the brands and the supermarkets themselves. And that is research, economic research. And it studies things like, you know, what are the popular brands? How much is advertising linked to 
the sales, for example. Another one that I find interesting is the placement of products. Is a particular placement more popular? Like, you know, in the supermarkets, you notice they have a lot of like, little candies and sweets and stuff near the uh, checkout counters. Again, that, that is to appeal to the kids, if you didn't know that. They, they see it, you know, you're putting the stuff there, you've got your little five-year-old kid and sees little sweets and they're like, oh, mommy, 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 can I have that? And they are more tempted by it. Whereas if they're spread out within the supermarket, you're just pushing your trolley by and they've got less time to actually, you know, focus in on those. And again, it helps with product placement and stuff like that. And it could be like you could want to place your product in a particular position, particular brand and things like that. And you can use this information, this research for better product placement and also in terms of what appeals to people more. So if you get some data on, okay, this like particular brand is very popular, even though it's identical to another brand, but maybe that brand has a picture of a teddy bear, a picture of a giraffe or something that's quite appealing. You realize, well, actually the packaging seems to make a difference. So economics can pull all that information in there and help companies promote their brand in I guess the most effective way possible for them to make more money. I don't necessarily agree with the way that's done. A lot of advertising, a lot of marketing is quite wasteful in the, in the broader picture anyway. But uh, like if you were to talk about game theory I mentioned in a few of my other videos, you find that if nobody marketed or advertised, you'd actually have a better solution. But if just one company were to advertise, then they would excel above all the others. Then every other company would feel that they'd have to compete with them with other some form of marketing. So in the end, you go from one position to another position. So let's say you're making this level of profit. And now let's say on average, let's say 50,000. So one company decides, on average, all making 50,000, let's say. So one company decides they want to do marketing. That may raise their profits up to, let's say, 80,000. And then everybody else follows suit. Not everybody else ends up with 80,000, of course, because of the increased competition, but because of the cost of marketing and advertising, everybody's profit comes down to maybe 15,000. So they all end up worse off. But if they were not market at all, they might make a loss. So it's, it's a little bit of a prisoner's dilemma. And you go back and look at my game theory uh, videos that explains a little bit more on that. All right, that takes us to an end of economics everywhere in regards to the supermarket. I covered off on a few things here. I like to mention I've also got a Steam It post that goes into a little bit more detail on a few other areas, a little, a little bit different in emphasis, so it's definitely worth a look as well. But if you enjoyed this video, remember to hit the like button, and if you want to see more videos like this in the Economics Everywhere series, as well as more videos relating to maybe microeconomics or cost-benefit analysis, I've still got my Dark Side series that's still rolling as well, and also the book I'm writing, uh, Vegan Economics, I'm going to have a few more vegan economics uh, videos to come reasonably soon. So we hit the subscribe button for that. And I'd like to thank you for watching this video today. And hopefully I will be seeing you all again fairly soon. Have a very good evening. Goodbye.